Let us pray. <laughs> All right. No, that's not where the evening is headed. Um, did you want to say a few words? or I'll say a few in a, in a moment, but, but carry All right. on. So uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an orientation to where we are this evening. I think this is actually uh, a unique opportunity that we have. Richard and I are both evolutionary biologists, dyed in the wool, and we come from um, a lineage of thought, and that lineage of thought has brought us to many of uh, the same conclusions. But there are places in which our thoughts depart from each other. And so tonight we're going to talk about biology, and especially, I believe, what it has to say about human beings and the manner in which they evolve. Um, the fact that we disagree over some important things is, uh, you know, potentially fraught, but I'm hoping that to the extent that there is a confrontation between ideas here, that it will be a friendly confrontation. I believe we are both from a tradition in which we believe that uh, honorable disagreement is important and it is essential to society functioning well, and so um, I hope that even if the disagreements um, are intense at times, that, uh, that it is in the context of, of friendship. Good. Right. All right. Good. So. <laughs> We're on the same page. Uh, maybe I should also say that um, I am at something of an advantage here because Richard has done such an excellent job of documenting his thoughts on evolution in his many excellent books. And for the 14 years that I taught evolutionary biology at Evergreen, I without fail assigned the selfish gene to my students. And the selfish gene you wrote in 1976, am I correct about that? You were 35 years old? Yeah. So Richard wrote that book as a young gun, and I find it shocking that I have to say this, but I think that that book is still cutting edge. The reason I assigned it to my students was that I thought that in general it presented the best encapsulation of what we understood about evolutionary dynamics that was available. And while there are a few things that aren't in it that have emerged later, I still believe that to be the case. And so one of the things we may end up talking about tonight is why it is that there has not been more progress after the huge burst of activity that we saw in the late 60s and early 70s, why uh, my era has been much quieter with respect to important discoveries about evolution that we all agree are true. Um, do you have anything to add? Yes, I, I don't quite know why you find it shocking. I mean, of course we all pay lip service to the idea that progress is good and, and we should be changing all the time, but what if we're right? And so um, it, do, it doesn't necessarily follow that uh, that W what people thought in the 1960s and 70s is still largely believed is a bad thing. Maybe it is actually right. Well, I think this is a, a very interesting perspective, and it's one that I held to. Uh, when I was in college, I was a student of Robert Trivers, who's a contemporary of, of Richard's. Um, and as his student, I looked at the landscape of questions, and I felt it wasn't resentment, but I felt some sadness that it looked like Richard and Bob's generation had run the table and they had solved all of the big issues in evolutionary biology and that they had left only small issues for us. And over time I came to realize that that wasn't the case, that there were major issues left unsettled that we had stopped talking about because there was no progress. And so um, I, I took up looking at those issues and saying, what is it that we have wrong that has caused us to stop making progress on questions like why do females in many species require males to, to engage in elaborate displays uh, before mating with them? That question is still not answered. There are plenty of ideas on the table, but as for one that we all agree on, nothing has emerged. Why are there more species when you get closer to the equator and fewer species as you move towards the poles? Why do we grow feeble and inefficient with age? These are all questions on which some progress had been made, but that progress seemed to me to have stagnated. So I don't disagree with you that your generation got an awful lot right, but what I wonder about is why progress has slowed given the number of large questions that remain, and a related question is why 
there does not seem to be a generation of biologists that followed you that appear to be working in a way that would allow them to solve big questions in the way that R.A. Fisher had, or you did, or Bob Trivers did. I don't see that generation of biologists that are capable of wielding tools in the bold way that, that you all managed. I think then the onus is on you. Let, I mean, let's talk about a particular example, like say the, se the sexual selection one you raised, um, and say, what is it that you think uh, hasn't been, well, obviously you're right, it's still going on and there's much controversy going on, it's a very flourishing field, there are lots of people working in the field, uh, doing work in the, in the, out in, in the field on sexual selection. There are two major strands of theory of sexual selection. Um, perhaps you could just trace them to Fisher on the one hand and, well, Wallace, um, Zahavi, um, Hamilton on the other. And they're both um, very interesting theories. They both, they, they probably might, might both work. I mean, what, what's wrong with that? Uh, uh. It's a great question. Um, here's what's wrong with it. So what, what Richard is referring to, uh, and I believe both you and I would come out on the Hamilton side of this argument, and we would both, I would imagine, be advocates for a good genes Well, no, I mean, I, I, I would be, do we need to explain what this is? I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, Darwin noticed that uh, many biological characteristics and animal characteristics of males especially are apparently advertising to females, peacock's tails, um, gorgeous feathers, beautiful fish, that kind of thing. And Darwin was content simply to say, that's what females like. It's an aesthetic thing, a matter of female whim. And so in order for a male to reproduce successfully and pass on his genes, he has to be attractive, and therefore genes for being attractive get passed on to the next generation because females choose them. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, hated that idea. Uh, Wallace was more of a utilitarian and believed that um, beautiful characteristics like peacock's tails had to be useful. Uh, it wasn't enough just to simply say females love them. You had to say this is somehow an advertisement for a good male, a male who's going to be a good father or a good, provide good genes. Wallace wouldn't have used that phraseology, of course. And that divide between Darwin and Wallace has persisted from the 19th century through the 20th century. Um, Wallace felt that to invoke uh, female taste was bordering on mysticism. Uh, and Darwin's idea there was rescued in the 1920s and 30s by R.A. Fisher, the, one of the great founders of modern population genetics. And R.A. Fisher made the, da the Darwin theory respectable by allowing female choice to be under genetic control just as much as male anatomy, male tails, etc., are, uh, are under genetic control. And Fisher produced uh, a, a model which must have been a mathematical model, although he didn't lay it out in mathematical terms, it must have been there, in which natural selection simultaneously works on genes in males for being beautiful and genes in females for liking beauty. And when you realize that both baby males and baby females inherit the genes from their father for being beautiful and the genes from their mother for liking beauty. Those two go together and can produce something like a peacock's tail. That was the Fisher theory which has been brought up to date by modern mathematical biologists. But the Wallace strand of theory, uh, which Brett favors and, and to some extent so, so do I, um, agrees with Wallace that beauty has to be useful and adopts the idea that what a female is doing when she, when she is beautiful is advertising to males that she, sorry, what a male is doing when advertising to females is advertising to females, for example, that he's healthy, that he's strong. In the extreme version of the theory due to Amos Zahavi, a male is, is advertising that he has He's such a, a good fit male that he's capable of surviving in spite of having this ridiculous tail, um, which should have killed him because it's vulnerable to predators, you can't fly very well with it and so on. Um, and less extreme versions of that theory are attributable to W.D. Hamilton, who thought that 
um, uh, health was the primary virtue which a male is advertising to females and a beautiful tail is an advertisement to a female this is a healthy male he's not suffering from parasites he's resistant to, pa to parasites otherwise he wouldn't have this beautiful glowing sexy tail so um, uh, that was just an interruption because we were talking about um, the, 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 the Harvey Hamilton type theory which Brett favors. I'm sorry, okay. So, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and it actually shows exactly the point that I was trying to make, which is that you've now heard a lot. There's plenty of good work um, that suggests that this could be a handicap um, that would demonstrate uh, the, the genes have to be heritable in order for females to be favored to be selecting for them. But the problem is that there is a rotten piece of this theory right at the heart which is that females are choosing to inflict this burden on their male offspring, which is ecologically certain to be costly to them. So if females are attempting to find good genes by putting males through a test, then they are inflicting bad genes on their male offspring. Those bad genes will be transmitted by their female offspring, but not expressed, so the females will not suffer the cost of that handicap, but there's a question of how it is that females recover enough of a benefit for their female offspring to justify the costs for the male offspring. So there's a way in which, although one can make a mathematically compelling argument for a handicap idea or, or a good genes idea, um, that it has to account for a very large benefit for female offspring, and what's worse if you imagine a species, like let's say we're talking about peacocks. Peacocks, the female, the peahen, inflicts this marvelous tail on her male offspring by choosing fathers that have it. In peacocks, like all creatures that have these elaborate displays, males contribute nothing other than genes. So if she's picking something valuable, it has to be encoded in the genes. Um, so she inflicts this cost on her male offspring and presumably then acquires a benefit for her female offspring. But they do this each and every generation. Only a small number of males in each generation mate. Females choosing these tails pick the same males again and again. So that ought to leave the number of bad genes in the environment very small because females are eliminating those bad genes each and every generation, which means that after a small number of generations, there ought to be very little advantage in picking males with beautiful tails because there are no bad genes left. And so the question is, if one of these good genes hypotheses is correct, why is female vigilance constant? It should be females select against bad genes, the number of bad genes drops, female vigilance now has no value, female vigilance should drop, bad genes should crop back up, female vigilance should rise again and we should see an oscillating pattern, but we don't see it. What we see is generation after generation, females choose the males with the most elaborate tails. So it doesn't matter what the answer is here. The point is this is a question that year after year remains with us and we make no progress on it. We are still fumbling with explanations that have one value but don't completely answer the question. So why is that? But this is a matter for mathematical modeling, and it's being done. And there are various different mathematical models, which um, we can't go into now. But, but, but I mean, th this is something that is an active field of theoretical research, well, and it's going on. Um, I must say I have become something of a skeptic of mathematical modeling because it suffers from two kinds of errors that are pretty obvious. One is it will sometimes give you an answer that is not viable in reality. In other words, if we were to mathematically model the way a sphere sits on a razor, as long as there are no other forces input into the system, we will be told that a sphere will balance on a razor. But we all know that a sphere doesn't balance on a razor. Right? Mathematical modeling will tell you that uh, a cup of coffee in a room will take an infinite amount of time to equalize, that it will approach the temperature of the room and the room will approach the temperature of the coffee, but they will never reach each other. We know that this isn't the case. So mathematical modeling has a way in which it can fool us into thinking that we have the right answer when we don't. And the other problem is that these mathematical models very frequently have so many parameters in them that you can 
match any natural behavior, even if the model isn't the reason that the natural behavior is what it is. So um, I, I am, I'm a little actually surprised to hear you defend... Yeah, but, the, the, but the remedy for that is better mathematical models. It's not throwing out mathematical models altogether. And, well, and I don't know. I, I had a, uh, a mentor um, in graduate school um, who was himself a mathematician, and he said something striking to me one day. He said that um, math is the language we resort to when we don't know how to explain something. And so I would argue, yes, mathematical models can reinforce an explanation that is itself sensible, but if we don't have an explanation that's actually satisfying, the fact that we have a mathematical model that suggests that I don't find especially compelling. Because there are lots of ways you can get there. Well, to, to go back to what you first started saying about the uh, the difficulty with the Zahavi theory that the, that the, the, the female inflicts on, the way you, you, you put it was right, the female in, inflicts upon her, her offspring the, 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 the handicap as well as the, as the benefit. I mean, that's exactly what I said in The Selfish Gene when I ridiculed the Zahavi theory. And mm -hmm. I was wrong, because my student, um, Alan Graffin, who's now a fellow professor at, at Oxford, did produce a mathematical model which does show that as a matter of fact the Zahavi theory can work and we were, we were I was wrong everybody else was wrong and and Gra Graffin showed that, that we were wrong by producing a mathematical model which shows that the that the, the Zahavi handicap theory can work um, and uh, I not being a mathematician myself have to bow to that I understand the model and I think I think it works I think it's a, it's a very good one and I ate humble pie. I, I said I was, I was wrong, and, and my student Alan Graffin was right. Well, but I think, I think you are too hasty to accept that you were wrong. And in fact, I'm, I'm not certain of this. It's been a while since I have read it. But if I'm correct, what you said about Zahavi in The Selfish Gene was that this didn't, am I right, that you said it didn't sound like the way natural selection works? I think I was a bit ruder about it than that. <laughs> That's likely. <laughs> Um, but I'm not quite sure what, I mean, wh how could you p possibly argue the case without, I mean, there, there are some cases where you on the whole not use mathematics myself, and I've done verbal argu arguments, and so I ought to be agreeing with you about this, but there are times when I have to say, um, a verbal argument simply isn't enough. You've got to actually do the sums. Well, I think a verbal argument has to um, be proven out by data, and one way to get data, it's, I have to say, not my favorite, but one way to get data is to generate a model that is sufficiently robust that it will spit out um, a behavior that mirrors what you see. But I, I also think that, in a sense, the field has adopted this modality of proving things because it has forgotten what to do. That there are actually features of the modern academic environment that are, that effectively rule out the kind of wonderful work that R.A. Fisher did or that you did. And so I think it is very much the fashion to, uh, to defer to these very powerful tools, but that the powerful tools actually have yet to, um, to reveal answers that are compelling and do predict things about nature that we, uh, that we do not um, know to be true at the point that we build the model. So if we can take the example of um, George Williams and his famous paper on the evolution of senescence. The wonderful thing about this paper is that it says if, if I, George Williams, am right about the cause of senescence, senescence being the um, the feebleness and inefficiency that accumulates with age. He said, if I'm right about the cause of this, then you will see these patterns in nature. And we knew for a long time, before we could find the genes he had predicted, we knew for a long time that, that his hypothesis was correct, in other words, that it was a theory, because when we looked at nature, we saw the exact pattern he had described. And so I'm a fan of that kind of work. You say, well, here's an observation, Here's the hypothesis that would explain it, and if this hypothesis is correct, this is the pattern we will see in nature, which we don't know if it's yeah. there yet, and then it's, it's there. I, I think we need to pause and explain George Williams's theory of senescence, um, because otherwise I don't think that... Sure.
um, make sense. Um, the, the problem of, of why natural selection favors um, growing old and dying of old, old age. And um, there had been wrong ideas, things like um, it's for the good of the species that the old ones die off and make way for the young ones, something like that. Well, that, that doesn't work. That's not the way natural selection works. Um, P.B. Medowa, and then refined by, by George Williams, came up with a much better genetically based theory, which is that if you imagine a gene, you, you, you know that any, any gene has its effect at a particular time of life, mostly during embryology, but genes go on maturing, making, making their presence felt at different times of life. Now, if you imagine a gene for um, giving you a, a fatal cancer when you're 10, and another gene for making your, giving, yourself a, giving you a fatal cancer when you're 20, another one when you're 30, another one when you're 40, another one when you're 50, etc., which one of them is going to get through to the next generation? A gene that gives you cancer and kills you when you're 60 has already got through to the next generation by the time it kills you. A gene that gives you cancer when you're 10 and kills you does not get through to the next generation. So there'll be natural selection in favor of late-acting fatal or sub-fatal genes. That was the Meadow version of the theory. The Williams version of the theory was a nice refinement of that, which is that the genes are modified by other genes. And so any gene which has a, um, a good effect when you're young, makes you, makes you fit when you're, when you're young, but kills you when you're, when you're old, um, is likely to survive. And the, the reverse is not likely to survive. So there's going to be a pressure in favor of um, perhaps uh, rushing around and, and expending all your energy when you're young in order to get your genes into the next generation when you're, when you're young at the expense of um, becoming um, uh, more likely to die when you're, when you're old. Um, so that's a rather bad summation of the Williams theory, but now we need to go back to... No, it's, um, it, it's pretty good, actually. I don't know um, if you know that I worked on this puzzle in graduate school. I saw I didn't know that, no. Oh, yeah. This is the place that you begin to understand what history really is, and it actually lends a great deal of power to your point about the need to rebel against selfish replicators. I mean, let's look Very at... Very much so, yes. Yeah. The, the Second yeah. World War. Yes. Right? Even the terminology. You had the fatherland effectively raping Mother Russia. I mean, that's even the terminology, right? So what this was, was a lineage level phenomenon in which a population uh, went after two other populations, one that was internal to its borders or its near neighbors, and one population that was distant but had a great many resources. But the point is, understood from the perspective of German genes, uh, vile as these behaviors were, they were completely comprehensible from the level of fitness. It was abhorrent and unacceptable, but understandable that Germany should have viewed its Jewish population as uh, a source of resources. If you viewed Jews as uh, non-people, then whatever resources they had could be uh, appropriated for German genes, and likewise, the future of Germany lies in Russia. All of the resources of Russia, and how many million, is it 20 million Russians it took to turn the German war machine around? So what you have are these population against population conflicts. If you view it as group selection, it makes no sense, but if you view them as lineages, it makes a great deal of sense, and the belief structures that caused people to step onto battlefields and fight um, were uh, clearly comprehensible as adaptations of the lineages in question. I think nationalism might be an even greater evil than religion. And I'm not sure that it's actually very helpful to talk about it in Darwinian terms. I think it's um, perhaps here that this might be a case where we do need to defer a little bit to historians and non-biologists and think about it in other ways. Why? I'm curious well, as to why you'd be resistant. Um, because I think human affairs are so complicated and, and so, uh, although ultimately we are evolved creatures, we have 
uh, our, our human affairs, our historical affairs, our social affairs are so um, distantly related upon a superstructure of biology that it's probably better not to ex try to explain them in simple biological terms. Ah, so I think this is then why we disagree on the importance of this. And I would say it's absolutely vital for us to confront this in biological terms. Um, if one imagines that we are remote from evolution by virtue of the fact that cultural evolution has taken over and is not, uh, is not furthering the interests of the genes, then this does become a complicated matter um, that is uniquely human. If, on the other hand, human beings are engaged in a fundamentally biological phenomenon that they do not consciously understand, then in order to confront it, I really believe we have to look at what we are and that your point about rebelling against the selfish replicators is the key that if I mean here's my feeling if I'm a robot that is programmed to be willing to put other people in a gas chamber under the right circumstances but I as a conscious being find that idea horrifying then I as a conscious being have to look at that uh, program and say under no circumstances will I be party to it. I don't care if it's biologically advantageous. It's not for me. And so um, the ability to resist the will of the replicators, I think, requires us to stare in the face what role this has played in our history uh, up until the present day. I think we agree about that. I think we've run out of time, haven't we? Um, well, that's a question for the audience, really. <laughs> Keep going. So, all right, what we're going to do... Wait, wait. The, okay. Uh, um, well, w we, should, we should vote, and we should give people but, but, a chance. But the, 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 the alternative is questions from, from the audience. Yeah. So, what we're going to do is we're first going to ask how many people would like to go to questions from the audience, and then we're going to ask how many people would like the discussion to continue uh, in the way that it's going. So, first question is how many people would like us to move on to questions from the audience. Uh, shout if you want questions from the audience. All right, and how many people would prefer that the discussion continue as it is? Okay. That sounded unambiguous to okay, me. Right, yep. um, you, again, you've got uh, your microphone coming off your ear. Um, okay, I don't know if you wanted to respond to the the last point, what I was saying is effectively that we must, as ugly as it is, we must confront what we are programmed for if we are to resist a recurrence of those patterns in the future. Okay, let's let that one go. Okay, right. we'll let that one go. Um, all right. Number six. Adaptation can directly explain obligate homosexuality, suicide, and celibacy in humans. Well, I think we do have, uh, as Darwinians, we do have an obligation to try to explain things which are, which are frequent enough to be um, not regarded as just mere aberrations. And so um, homosexuality in humans is frequent enough that it, and, 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 and indeed it is, it is a genetic thing. And so, so we cannot um, duck our responsibility to try to, so at least it, it deserves to have a, a Darwinian explanation. Um, we know that there's a genetic component from such things as twin studies. And, uh, and we know that it's frequently, frequent enough that it's not just a result of recurrent mutation. So yes, there has to be some sort of Darwinian explanation. Yeah. And there's also fascinating pattern um, that also suggests a Darwinian explanation, although um, confusing. So I would point to the uh, older brother right hand rule. Yes. The more older brothers you have, the more likely you are to be gay, but only so long as you're right-handed. Right? That's a very interesting pattern that has been replicated multiple times. And it suggests that there's something going on with homosexuality more than some uh, failure due to novelty. It suggests that there's um, some sort of structure to it and a, and a meaning that we haven't yet uh, figured out. So how about uh, suicide? Do you see that one as um, explicable? Well, uh, I'm not, I haven't thought about that to the same extent. Have you thought about it? I mean, um, um, yes. Okay. So, uh, all right. I mean, I can easily think of psychological explanations in, me in mimetic explanations, perhaps. Um, genetic explanations for suicide. Do, do you have them? 
Well, uh, I think in principle, many of these things come back to the same couple of places where our field has um, instantiated a bad assumption. And so the assumption about individual selection where lineage selection might be um, a more powerful concept has caused us, I think, to miss the boat on all three of these uh, characteristics. What I would say is, let's just take a, uh, an example of the Middle East, for example. Let's say you have two populations in the Middle East, and both of them correctly recognize that 500 years from now, they are not both likely to be there, that it is likely to be one or the other, but not both. Were that the case, then any fitness that was realized in the present day would be more or less meaningless if you were in the population that blinked out 200 years from now. So you would find a rational investment in behaviors that discounted individual fitness and prioritized lineage fitness. In other words, you would see extraordinary levels of self-sacrifice in the interest of ensuring that the population to which the individual doing the sacrifice uh, belonged was the one that continued to exist. I don't know how clear that was, but the basic idea is in extraordinary circumstances, like for example, a piece of land that isn't getting any bigger and is fully inhabited and has competing lineages uh, that cannot simply live peaceably together, that um, suicidal self-sacrifice might be rational. Now again, naturalistic fallacy being what it is, just because something is doesn't mean it ought to be, and I'm not defending it as a good thing, but I'm saying, can we understand it rationally? If we think about adaptation occurring at the lineage level, I think it's not hard to see cases where um, suicide, I mean, really it's one step past getting on a ship and going over the horizon to see if you can find a new landmass that nobody's discovered. That's a near suicidal behavior that's somewhat comprehensible. Actual suicide can make sense if um, the circumstances are extraordinary enough. And I would also say, closer to home, that if we look at cases where people uh, commit suicide in our own culture, very frequently they are beset by the sense that they are beyond worthless, that they have no value, that their existence is simply taking up resource. And so you can imagine that this could be a matter of kin selection or lineage selection. That if you, and I think most people who believe that uh, in our culture are not calculating correctly, they have bad data on what, the, what value they might contribute, but nonetheless, were you to be triggered to imagine that you had no value and that you were simply burning up resources, then this is a rational course of action. I do not think it's helpful to couch this kind of explanation in Darwinian terms. Da Darwinian evolution is about the natural selection of replicators. And the primary replicators we're talking about are genes, and the vast majority of biological evolution, and you've been advocating the priority of this genetic selection, um, producing bodies and brains the way they are. And now we come on to things like nationalism, things like um, individuals sacrificing themselves for the sake of the long-term future of their lineage, their society, their nation. Um, th this is not Darwinism. This is, this is something else. This is, this is a, a, a complicated mixture of human-level affairs, which historians deal with, sociologists deal with, psychologists deal with. This is not Darwinism. It's not helpful to... It, it's, 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 it's not helpful to try to couch this in what, what sounds like Darwinian terms. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's just see where it is that we disagree. My claim is that if it is true, and I obviously can't say if it is or it isn't, but if it is true that things like xenophobia, genocide, suicide are products of adaptive evolution, that in order to address these things going forward in a useful way, understanding their nature is likely to be beyond helpful and may even be essential. So to give 
one example. Let's say that the impulse to genocide is something that lurks inside human beings, awaiting certain indicators that it is the moment for that program to be triggered. Were that the case, you would want people to engage that question ahead of time when they were in possession of their full faculties and to recognize that they might have a program within them that violates the values that they believe are their, their guide. Yes, but I think I would prefer to say that these impulses are byproducts of something primitive and evolved. So something like genocide. Um, we know that chimpanzees, for example, um, do practice genocide against rival groups of, of, ch of chimpanzees. One can make a genetic evolution case that says something like this. In our wild ancestry, uh, using the Hamilton idea of living in villages, living in small bands, um, the companions that you know that are familiar to you from day to day, everybody you know is a, is, is a relative, strangers are not. And so killing strangers, uh, genocide, killing neighboring bands of people like happens in some parts of the New Guinea Highlands, for example, um, that could be regarded as a byproduct of genetic natural selection. And something like the, um, the Nazi atrocities could be regarded as a manifestation of that genetically evolved um, tendency. But it's in a totally different context. And um, of course, I agree with you that the, the, we need to resist the, we need to rebel against the, the selfish genes. But I prefer not to talk about the things that we do in our modern society in a sort of straightforward biological way, but rather to say these are relics, byproduct relics of our genetic past. And one can do, th do this all the time, and I think that we do it, we do it a lot. We do things like um, the desire for business executives to have a bigger, thicker office carpet, that kind of thing. This is all, um, you, can, you can interpret that in a sort of biological way as, being, as representing something like uh, something that came from our biological past. But you have to be very careful when you do it. Mm. And uh, I don't, I, I think it's very often not very helpful to try to apply Darwinian ideas directly to um, the sorts of things that we, we get in, in modern society, whether it's horrible mechanized warfare or, or executives demanding bigger desks or, or whatever it is. Um, I, I just think we've got to be very careful in, in applying. I mean, I, I am in favor of evolutionary psychologists who do this kind of thing, but I think they do do it in a, in a careful way. And, and I, I think we've got to be very cautious in the way we do it. Well, you and I are in 100% agreement that we need to be extremely careful in applying evolutionary logic, and it is possible to get carried away. I, for example, would not argue that we can apply evolutionary logic to anything so new that we don't know if it stands the test of time, right? So um, I have a test of adaptation that just simply tells you whether or not you are uh, on solid ground to presume that something is adaptive, and it involves looking at whether something has a complexity, whether it has a cost, a variable cost that could be reduced, and whether it persists over evolutionary time. So wanting a bigger desk is I think you and I would agree, certainly a manifestation of something evolved, but it's very hard to analyze desks with Darwinian tools because desks are new. Um, but something like genocide is not new. Warfare is not new. And yeah. so these things are complex, expensive. We're seeing a history that goes into antiquity and beyond. And that, I believe, not only gives us license to apply Darwinian tools, but I would say, A, it is the most parsimonious explanation, and B, it is our best hope 
of ending these patterns permanently. If I didn't believe that, I would be much less enthusiastic about what is revealed by these analyses. I would say they are justified, but I might not be a champion of doing it, and I might not be so interested in doing it personally. But to the extent that I would love to see an end to genocide, I think facing what it actually appears to be is essential. Okay, but su su suppose... But so suppose you take the example of the of the Nazi in invasion of the lands to the east, which you did before. Um, you've got uh, you've got a, a, a nation taking a decision, which is a, a dictator and advisors and a parliament and and all, uh, it's a complicated matter of a state taking a decision to invade an, an, another state using modern weapons and using the um, weapons of diplomacy to argue the case in, 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 in international um, courts and so on. Um, and then you've got the individual soldiers going out there and killing people. And the, the psychological motives of the individual soldiers are going to be so different from those... I mean, they're not the ones who are actually taking the decision to go and invade Poland. Um, they are doing quite different things. They're obeying their officers, they're, they're perhaps giving vent to uh, revenge motives because their comrade was killed in a previous battle or something of that sort. These are very, very complicated mixtures of, of motives, psychological motives. Um, and yes, they are, all of them, products of brains which were honed by natural selection. Um, but I don't think it's helpful to to unite them all and say, well, this is, this is all um, one biological impulse to do, do something or other. They're, they're different things at different levels. Well, I do think you're, you're right about that at, in one level. So if we look at uh, um, the genocide between Hutus and Tutsis, these distinctions were actually um, phenotypically imposed. In other words, this is the rare case where you have a genocidal impulse that appears to be triggered by the artificial, and now it may mirror an actual lineage phenomenon, but what you had was people measuring noses and eyes and things like this and imposing the sense that these are your people and those are the enemy, and it triggered a genocide. On the other hand, what I think we need to be aware of, uh, and I, this is a dangerous topic to open, but I would say during the last presidential election, uh, we had a cynical fella um, who began to intone some of the same ideas that lead people to some sort of nationalistic fervor. And to the extent that that program that is looking for the moment in history at which this is the correct way to behave, that those detectors might have been up and waiting for somebody to use that kind of rhetoric, that we may find ourselves dragged into something we could anticipate but won't if we don't confront it and that it is much better to understand, for example, that when you move from a phase where you have growth or something that seems like growth that makes people feel comfortable, makes them keep their head down, makes them treat their neighbors basically all right, when that breaks down at the point that you run out of growth, the natural impulse is to become tribal and go after those who aren't so closely related to you. And so to the extent that we can be taken advantage of by a leader who would cynically or otherwise um, lead us into some sort of tribal warfare, we need to recognize that danger and say, actually, is there a way out of here that is novel? Can we do something that isn't evolutionary, but actually matches the values that we believe ourselves to hold, the values yeah. that are defensible. I, I think that's right. I, th I think that, that it is important to recognize things like tribalism. I think that, that's a probably a real, a, a real phenomenon which is important and which can be and is played upon by um, demagogues. And um, so, yes, uh, tribalism and there are some other things like that which, which are important. Um, and when I say that they're distanced from the biological, or some of them are more distanced than others, and, and some of them are pretty naked, are pretty, are pretty close to the surface. And I think that, um, that the tribalism which is invoked both in the case of the uh, Hutus and, and the Tutsis and in the case of the recent election 
disaster. Um, <laughs> that probably is, suffi is sufficiently close to, to, um, to, the, to the surface that, it, that it's not unreasonable to use biological terminology and make uh, and, and notice resemblances to, say, the battles between New Guinea Highland tribes, that kind of thing. Good. Well, I guess then that suggests that there is something that I don't, I don't think I've seen, which is, is there a, uh, a program in which people are seeking what are the legitimate boundaries of discussion for Darwinian selection, and when do we move into phenomena that are not amenable or don't benefit from that kind of perspective? So I think I hear you and me converging on the idea that this is dangerous territory, it is quite possible to extend it too far, but that there may be great value if we wish to avoid the worst instincts that human beings have in understanding what their Darwinian underpinnings are and how we might, you know, in the same manner that you invoke uh, birth control, family planning is, uh, I think we both agree, um, contrary to fitness in many cases. Um, how can we take that model where we have stepped away from a biological imperative to increase fitness at all costs and we've done something more reasonable, family planning, how can we apply that same kind of logic to things like warfare and genocide and demagoguery? It is a useful model because um, contraception is a case where we have stepped back from biology and we, so it shows that we can do it. Yes. And, yes. Okay. It does, but it also shows us um, this arbitrary nature of uh, when you can. Because the reason that we can do it with birth control is an accident of evolution, which is that sexual pleasure and sexual reproduction are not synonymous. We have been wired with a program that causes us to seek sexual pleasure in a way that results in reproduction, but because they aren't the same thing, they can be technologically decoupled, which makes family planning an almost trivial matter. You can engage in it without engaging in a fight with yourself. Um, had would, would, would you say tribalism is de decoupled, uh, has been decoupled in sports, um, football hooliganism, and... Um, uh, <laughs> Yes, I would say this is a place actually where you loyalty, see... Loyalty to your team and... and yes. yes, not necessarily productively, but that it is a case in which you see people's tribal impulses being applied to what is effectively one corporation battling another on yeah. a field. I mean, that's what they are. A corporation buys a bunch of players, another corporation buys one. It's not like two towns are fighting each other, but people get involved in it like it is. And so, yes, I think it is, it's a place where it's been decoupled almost by accident. Have you noticed what... Um, soccer players do when they've just scored a goal, they throw a spear, they, go, they, they, they rush around, they like that. <laughs> That's good. That does seem like what they do. <laughs> All right. Um, shall we move down the list to even more infuriating things? All right. Number seven. I, I really want to know your reaction to this one. I've been waiting all night. Um, Catholics, are you social? Does everybody in the audience understand what the claim is? That you have a non-reproductive caste within Catholicism. Other religions too, but Catholics are uh, kind to us in that they make everything so elaborate that we can... Well, worker bees don't reproduce. Right. Neither priests do theoretically don't. Yeah, priests theoretically don't, and neither do none. Well, I think most of them probably don't. Okay. Don't you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, all right, the question is, you know, you allege in The Selfish Gene that a celibate clergy is a failure of Darwinian selection. My claim here is that this isn't a failure, that this is adaptive celibacy, that it serves a lineage-level purpose. It's meme-level. That's what's going on there. It, the but if it's meme-level, then each of those priests and each of those nuns is involved in a spectacular loss of a reproductive opportunity. I mean, this is the argument you lay yeah. out. So the question is, why are they so vulnerable to accept? I mean, most people couldn't forego uh, romance and sex if they tried. And yet you have a group of people that is triggered to avoid these things, and they do so in the service of a bunch of ideas that, yes, are literally 
false. A bunch of ideas, that's exactly right, a, bu a bunch of memes. So, memes that make some individuals, in, in Ireland for example, it's, it, it has traditionally been a prestigious thing for one member of the family, one brother, to become a priest, a, a, celib a celibate priest. So the priest devotes all his energy to proselytizing and spreading the meme mm -hmm. and, the other, and all the, all the other, other memes. It's the better to persuade other Catholics to have more children than they should. And so that, ah, but then that, uh, isn't it interesting that this person who, uh, according to you, is involved in a failure of Darwinism just so happens to behave in a way that his genes are likely to be spread by virtue of the fact that he's encouraging... Not his genes, his memes. No, his genes. He's part of a lineage. Oh, as it happens in, in Ireland, as yes, it's true. Well, um, but I mean, it, th this is my claim, is that it is almost always going to be the case in any persistent religion that where you have people engaged in what appears to be some spectacular failure of Darwinism, that they just so happen to be spreading ideas that will result in the genes that are allowing them to fail as Darwinian entities to succeed by the lineage that holds those they, beliefs. They devote farther. all their energies to spreading Catholic memes and they, they don't have to bother with the, the time and the responsibilities of a family. So they're, they're wholly devoted to spreading Catholic memes, including incidentally, more than incidentally, the meme for celibacy. Well, they so spread the meme for celibacy, which my claim, I mean, if I'm right about this, then my point would be that Catholic, uh, Catholic lineages would actually do less well, well if everybody reproduced, that there is an advantage to having individuals who have stepped out of the reproductive market and therefore become capable of speaking on behalf of the lineage. That somebody who is outside, I mean, think about a priest can't make a ton of money, right? And they can't reproduce, right? At least not out in public. And so the point is that takes them out of two modes through which they might be corrupted. Somebody who can't be corrupted because they're not in a position, even if they were to accumulate money, they couldn't spend it without calling attention to themselves. And they're not in a position to be sexually corrupted, at least not out in public. And so those two mechanisms just so happen to put them in a position to speak for, uh, for the lineage. So what are we disagreeing about? I mean, I, I, I don't know, no, maybe no, nothing. No. <laughs> but if, if that is the case, so, all right. You say, what are we disagreeing about? Is Catholicism a mind virus? Well, it, 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 it's a complex of mind viruses, yes. That's what we're disagreeing about. Okay. Okay, my claim is that Catholicism is a complex of adaptations, that they are lineage-level adaptations, and that they are in large measure responsible for the success of lineages that hold this set of beliefs having spread around the globe and having been so successful, efficient at creating adaptations of all types sort of argument. Let, let me attempt to um, place my worldview in a few sentences, please. Um, Darwinian natural selection is all about the differential survival of replicators. There are various kinds of replicators of which genes are some and memes are other and they are all um, engaged in a kind of tussle with each other to survive as replicators using vehicles which are bodies and which are brains and which are all sorts of other artifacts and things like that. Our separate genes, although they are, we, we, we unite them together under the one word genome, are actually, I regard them as similar to viruses in that they are um, changing their partners in every generation and you can regard the whole um, genome as a massive collection of viruses, massive collection of um, independently tussling replicators who survive better because they go around together as a gang. They survive better in the company of other such replicators and that's why we call them genes rather than viruses. There are others which survive better not going around in gangs, but going around by being sneezed into the atmosphere, or whatever it is, by, by spreading around by other means. The only difference, the fundamental difference between those replicators which we call genes and those which we call viruses are, 
that the method of transmission to the future of what the ones that we call genes are through our sperms or our eggs and therefore they have a, an interest in common to preserve the body in which they share because that's the only way they're going to get into the next generation that minority of them which are not destined to get into the next generation get into the future via sperms or eggs but by being sneezed into the air or um, defecated into the sewage system or, various, or, or left as blood lying around or something like, like that um, we call them viruses and the only difference is that their hope of getting into the future is not to cooperate with others in getting into an egg or a sperm but getting out of the body in a different way by being, by being sneezed. Now, um, memes are more of the latter category. They don't go through sperms and, or, 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 or eggs. They do, however, quite to a, quite a large extent, go down through generations longitudinally. So though it's not sperms or eggs, they do go from parent to child. But we, we, we live in a great soup of replicators which are floating around. Some of them are memes, some of them are genes, some of them are cooperative genes which go th through the generations through sperms and eggs. Some of them are cooperative memes that go through the generations in the form of, of parents indoctrinating children or schools indoctrinating, in, indoctrinating children. But everything we see around us is a soup of replicators and their phenotypic tools of replication among which are extended phenotypic tools of replication. And that's my piece said. Okay. So I have, a, of course, agree with most of what you said. I, I uh, in my own mind, think of genes at the moment that the zygote is created. They may be very uneasy with each other up to that moment, but th at the moment they are fused into a zygote, that single cell that then becomes a 30 trillion cell human, let's say. Um, they fall in love because, as you say, they have no mechanism for reproducing other than creating such an effective, coordinated creature that it is capable of reaching a moment of reproduction. And so it is that being trapped with shared fate that caused them to, causes them to behave as an organism that is united in its, in its purpose. So I, I think we agree on that. Um, in order to explain my perspective and where I think we differ, um, I need to borrow a concept from you, and I think you have described it as your most important contribution, and you just invoked it, the extended phenotype. Do you want to explain what that means in brief form? Can you do it? How long have I got? I mean, I can do it pretty briefly. <laughs> well, um, the normal, the normal word phenotype applies to bodies, and the, the gene sits inside its body and influences the phenotype by means of um, embryonic, embryonic processes. So wings and noses and, and toenails and hairs and things are all phenotypes. Extended phenotypes are outside the body and they include things like beaver dams and termite mounds and birds' nests. They are they're not part of the body, but they are every bit as much to be regarded as phenotypes, adaptations by genes for the propagation of genes. So although the genes don't actually live inside the nest and don't actually live inside the caddis fly house, uh, or, the, or, the, or the, the beaver dam. And nevertheless, the, these artifacts are all phenotypic devices for the preservation and propagation of the genes that created them. You generalize that then to parasites influencing hosts uh, for, the, for their own benefit. Parasites that cause their intermediate hosts to be more likely to be eaten by their final host and therefore passed on to the next part of the parasite cycle. The genes of the parasite are exerting phenotypic effects on the host so that parasite genes have extended phenotypic effects on host bodies. Extend that further and you have things like cuckoos who manipulate their foster parents into feeding them. Um, the genes that make the baby cuckoo effective at manipulating and persuading the foster parent to feed it are exerting extended phenotypic effects on 
the behavior of the parent. Generalize it further, and when a bird sings, when a, when a nightingale sings and influences the hormonal state of a female nightingale, when a canary sings, and so on, then the effect on the female body of the male song is extended phenotypic effect of genes in the singing male. And that's the story of the extended phenotype. So, let's take your example of, of a beaver pond, just to make this crystal clear. So, a beaver is a rodent that creates a dam by cutting down trees and blocking a waterway. That dam is necessary to its ecology. It uses the water to preserve wood that it can eat over the winter. Um, and your point in the extended phenotype, which I think is brilliant, is that the pond is every bit as much a part of this story as the molecules inside the beaver. That the genes inside the beaver create a system of physiology that is the beaver's cells, but it also creates the pond, which is part of the beaver's ecology, and it is artificial to divide the pond from the beaver, that it is the extended phenotype of the beater, beaver that is in the pond. I agree with this. My point would be, memes are extended phenotype, and that the claim that memes are competing in their own meme sphere is a little bit like saying that ponds reproduce themselves using beavers which you can definitely make that argument, but it's not the most parsimonious explanation for beaver ponds. Beaver ponds are created by beavers to facilitate their own ecology, and they are passed down to next generation beavers, right? This piece of ecology is handed down, sometimes over the course of decades or even a hundred years. These ponds, these alterations of the landscape are handed down as an inheritance to future generations of beavers. And that, to me, looks very much like a lineage handing down a belief system that results in it being ecologically effective at doing things like holding a piece of territory, excluding others from it, taking over new territory by dispersing. And so, memes are extended phenotype. My way of thinking is they should not be analyzed on their own, they should be analyzed as serving the interests of the underlying genome the same way ponds are serving the interests of the underlying beaver genome. I'm familiar with the fallacy. Uh, that, that is absolutely wrong. Um, uh, there, there, there is a succession that goes beaver gene pond, beaver gene pond, and so on. And, and you, superficially, you could say that either one should, could be regarded as the phenotype of the other, the replicator. But the, the key point is that ponds don't mutate and therefore are more likely to survive than not. Genes do, and that's the fundamental fallacy in this, uh, this argument. I call it Bateson's fallacy, who, who said that, that birds are just a nest way of making another, another nest. Um, it, 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 it's, you've got to look at the replicator is the one which mutates and as a consequence produces more copies of itself which, which survive. That's what genes do, that's what memes do, but that's not what ponds do, it's not what beavers do, it's not what nests do. Well, I mean, I must say that when you turn this back on me and you say that ponds do not mutate, I'm just tempted to, to take up that challenge because I think they do. And I don't think that this is a good way to understand them. This is my point, is that we can treat them that way. Beaver ponds actually do empty when they, a no, dam but breaks. Then, but then they don't give rise to daughter empty ponds. Well, but the point is, a beaver who builds a pond that empties is much more likely uh, to suffer starvation Precisely. during the winter. Precisely, and it's the, it's the, it's the the beaver, the beaver that does the building, You're making and the my beaver point. gene that makes it. This is exactly my point, that the way to understand something like Catholicism is not a thing unto itself. It is a program that runs on the computer inside the head of a Catholic. And so the way to properly understand it, the way to get the maximum power, is to understand it as extended phenotype of the creatures in whom the program is running, just as the way to understand beaver ponds is to understand them as extended phenotype of the beaver. They are a means to an end employed by beavers to preserve food over the winter, among other things. I can only quote W.B. Yeats, you are still wrecked among heathen dreams. <laughs> Wait, I don't Sorry, think look, I speak look, English look, well enough to understand what you just accused me of. <laughs>
The fundamental logic of natural selection is that there are replicators which mutate yep. and which produce copies which may or may not survive because they're good at surviving. The way they're good at surviving is by building phenotypes. Genes mutate, ponds don't. That is absolute... When you say ponds mutate, you, you didn't really mean that. What you meant was that ponds change. Of course they do. They drain, they, go, they, they burst their dam, they do all sorts of things. But that doesn't replicate. That doesn't give rise to a new generation of defective ponds. Oh. What does give rise to a new generation of defective ponds is a mutant gene in a beaver who builds a bad a bad dam. We don't, we don't disagree about We this. don't, indeed. We agree about the beaver example, and what we don't agree is how to map it onto the example of people and belief systems that exist over a long period of time. That's the question. We agree that it is an inferior understanding of beaver ponds to imagine that they mutate and either do or don't pass themselves down based on the quality of the information encoded there or whatever. So the question is, what is the best way to understand somebody who says something perfectly at odds with what we can discover in a science lab, but that in saying this thing, they are highly successful at uh, recovering resources from their local ecology and spreading into new habitats and taking over territory, excluding others, all of these things. And my point is simply, that is the extended phenotype of the creature that is engaged in this behavior. And to the extent that it persists over evolutionary time, what it's telling us is that in spite of the fact that those beliefs are not literal, that they are effective. I think you can make a case that um, ideas, uh, for example, you're now talking about religious ideas. Yep. Um, religious ideas spread because they're spreadable. It's tautological, just like natural selection. Um, and the reason they're spreadable is that they appeal to people, they appeal to people's psychology, etc. That's, that's why they spread. Um, you are trying to say, what are you trying to say, extended phenotype, that, the, that, the, um, that a, a meme is an extended phenotype? No, a meme is a replicator. It, it is a replicator, and I'm not arguing that absent any other system, that there wouldn't be a trivial competition between memes. In fact, we see a trivial competition yes, between I, memes on the internet. I agree. It, it might be trivial, and, and I, I don't think I ever wanted to make the case that there really is an important evolution resulting from the natural selection of memes. I think there might be. It was a hypothesis that there might be. I just wanted to say they do function as replicators. I think it is unhelpful to call them extended phenotypes. They're not phenotypes. Is it time? Okay. Yeah. Well, let me make one more point, then you can make the final point, and then we'll, we'll close this down. The key question and the prediction of the model that I'm presenting is that memes should show no interest in passing themselves down when it is not in the interest of the creature on whose minds they are operating. So, for example, we both agree that a language is a meme complex. And my point would be, if you move to another country that doesn't speak your language, you will have trouble adopting the language of that country. But your children will not experience a tension between their ancestral language. They will actually very easily acquire the language of the new habitat. Why? Because their old language is not struggling to survive they are struggling to survive, and the very best tool that they can have to survive in this new habitat is the language that allows them to interface with the people who are there. So the question is, if you are right about the nature of memes and that the point of their stickiness is about their own propagation and is orthogonal to the propagation of the genomes of the creatures that have these cultural structures, then those things should fight like crazy to stick around even in circumstances where they have no value. In my model, those things will gladly disappear in favor of superior meme complexes when it is advantageous to do so in some local circumstances. So it actually predicts a different behavior. I don't know whether, I don't know whether a meme, differential meme survival really is an evolutionarily important uh, effect or not. Um, all I'm saying is that what matters in natural selection is the differential survival of replicators. In the case of gene replicators, then we know about the phenotypes that may cause them to survive, and it's, it's very clear, we understand it pretty well. In the case of memes, we don't know, 
and it may be that um, maybe the meme level natural selection is only in its infancy, maybe the internet will see it developing further. Um, but I don't see any reason at all to regard that if there is a, a reason why some means spread more than others, among those reasons is likely to be the predispositions provided by genes and genetic selection, but that's not the only one. The memes exist in an ecology of their own and they might very well spread whether or not the ecology in which they spread is, as you would put it, the prior favorable one of that provided by gene selection. It's an important component, but not the only one. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I must say, I think we made more progress than we might have. So. Let's give a huge round of applause to Richard and Brett Weinstein.